In the world of Final Fantasy XIV, many a person will get the chance to explore a world filled with magic, technology and more, but the world that is explored wasn't always the same. In fact, the land of Eorzea has been built up and destroyed many times over, until it became what it is now. If ever you were curious to know how all this history came to be, then you've come to the right place. Welcome adventurer to the Wizards and Warriors complete collection of Eorzean history. From the gilded halls of an advanced empire, all the way to the modern age left in the wake of a dragon's wrath, you'll leave today with an understanding of how and why this world has changed so much over the course of each astral era and umbral calamity. So let us begin with one of the most powerful civilizations that Eorzea had ever known, the Alagan Empire. Their power stemmed from their technology, and as you might guess, so did their ultimate downfall. Technology can be used to improve your life or used against you to make it miserable, and what the Alagans lacked was a sensible philosophy of safeguards like we do. After all, we have useful tools, like our sponsor NordVPN, with a special offer at nordvpn.com slash wizardsandwarriors. The world of Eorzea was changed by the coming of technology under the Alagans, whose devices allowed them to conquer the world. Today, there are those who are turning their technology against you, because your life is exposed to the internet, and that's where a single fraction of a second is all it takes to seize your identity, wealth and personal data. With NordVPN, your internet use is encrypted and secured, acting like a tank that draws all the aggro from you and leaves your enemies without a hope. And it's extremely easy to use too, enabling encryption, threat protection against malware, and moving your IP across the globe, all with single clicks. That means you get more control, more safety, more region-locked content, and less chance of your immense power leading to your ultimate downfall. Which is nice, eh? Get started with NordVPN at our link nordvpn.com slash wizardsandwarriors, where if you use our code wizardswarriors, you'll get 4 free months on top of a 2 year plan. And they also offer a 30 day money back guarantee, so you can try it all out risk free. That's nordvpn.com slash wizardsandwarriors and code wizardswarriors. We begin our journey on a world called Hydaelyn. This planet gained its name from a goddess whose voice could be heard echoing from the heart of the world. Here there are countless varieties of monsters and people, with the most common mortal races of man being known as the Adaptable Hure, Honourable Elizan, Clever Lalafell, Rugged Rogadon, Traditional Mikote, Proud Ora, Mystical Viera, and Respectable Hrothgar. These races and their various cultures make up the bulk of the world's population and spearhead most historic events. But our story brings us to Eorzea, a land located on the continent of Aldenard. This place is sacred, as energy called Aether, which is responsible for creating life and magic, is denser here than anywhere else in the world. It's within this land that the Alagans would eventually emerge. The history of this empire begins in the scorching heat of the Third Umbral Calamity, also known as the Calamity of Fire. The Calamities are cataclysmic events that cover every inch of the planet for years, with every age afterwards being called an Astral Era. The first Calamity was that of wind, scarring the world with constant tornadoes and hurricanes. The second was that of lightning, as massive bolts of electricity would fall like rain. This, the third calamity, saw the entire world plagued by stifling heat. Crops withered and died, lakes dried up, and it felt as if the entire world had become akin to a desert. The various races and cultures that populated the world at this point were very superstitious, believing that the sun itself was punishing them for trying to stand at the side of gods through the creation of magic and sorcery in the second astral era. While the third umbral calamity would humble the survivors of this tragedy, they became wary of the gods. So if the use of spellcraft to emulate the divine was forbidden, then they'd attempt to uplift themselves through the hands of man alone. Eventually, the heat of the third calamity subsided, allowing the world to return to normal. This gave way to the third astral era, and an age of science had begun. 
The races of Eorzea that had abandoned the excessive worship of gods found that they had more time to spend on things like scientific research. No longer were people simply concerned with what magic could do for them. Instead, they developed various tools and devices that could use the energy of Aether. Most commonly, this condensed energy is seen as elemental crystals, and they found ways to use them to power a variety of devices. This only fueled their passion for discovery, as practices like chemistry began to emerge as well. But amongst all the people trying to create the next best thing, stood a man who would eventually control most of the world. The great and powerful Zande took to the field. Zande was a man of mystery. He appeared within Eorzea seemingly out of nowhere. But when he arrived, everyone saw him as a genius. His knowledge of both magic and the material surpassed what many could imagine. This vast understanding of the world, combined with his charismatic personality, made people flock to him in droves, eager to work alongside or learn from him. As groups of followers began to grow into massive organizations, Zande's influence started to birth a new nation. The culture of this budding society was rich with diversity as he welcomed scientists, mages, priests and scholars from all over Eorzea. In time, the magical and scientific development of his people couldn't be matched, and shortly after, the nation of Alag was officially created. Being the most advanced nation to rise in the wake of the Third Umbral Calamity, Zande and his forces were unmatched. By making exclusive use of both technological might and battle mages, their nation's military was already a force to be reckoned with. Zande would spread his nation's influence throughout the entirety of Eorzea, hoping to bring all of its people under one unified roof. The various tribes and small towns across the land stood no chance of winning. It was with shows of strength that Zande encouraged many people to peacefully surrender to his growing country. Upon realizing the benefits of becoming one with the nation of Alag, most conceded. Those few groups that refused to back down without a fight were overwhelmed and made part of his nation regardless. After annexing large sections of Eorzea, Zande crowned himself emperor, and so began the years of the mighty Alagan Empire. Over time, Zande would start to promote the wisest and most powerful mages in his country to stand as military leaders and overseers of scientific development. This proved to be the best possible move, as embracing magic instead of shunning it made sure the minds of his followers were open and curious instead of short-sighted and paranoid. Eventually, a breakthrough was made, as the spellweavers and engineers began to discover ways to hybridize magic with technology. With the right enchantments, siege weapons would not only shoot further, but they would strike harder as well. Similarly, cranes made to lift heavy objects were pushed ten times past their normal weight limits with these advancements. This made the minds of creative individuals run wild, wondering how far they could push the bounds of magic and physics. The fusion of spells and science was steadily applied to everything, from construction and agriculture to military and medicine. This became its own unique field of development, and was officially dubbed Aetherochemistry. It's on the foundations of Aetherochemistry that the Alagan Empire would grow into a paradise. With this new revolutionary field of research, their society was finally without equal, and thus began the Alagan's Golden Age. At the peak of his time as emperor, Zande had conquered all of Eorzea, and the glory of his country was there for all to see. But no man lives forever, not even the emperor. Zande knew that in order to maintain the empire's strength after his death, a strict set of rules and expectations needed to be set in place. So it was that his direct descendants would follow his example even after his passing. These new emperors would do as their founder demanded, and continue the expansion of their country across all three of the great continents. Once the rest of Aldenard was secured, it would only be a matter of time as they conquered the rest of Ilsabad and Othard. Because of the power brought on by Aetherochemistry, no other nation on the three great continents could stand up to the empire for long. Gradually, all of them would live under the Alagan flag. With no enemy that could possibly stand up to them, the empire entered a time of peace that would ultimately benefit everyone. 
even the conquered nations were able to partake of the benefits that came with imperial rule. Advanced science and medicine saw their people prosper like they never had before, and all living within the three continents would enjoy this peace for generations. They even began crafting various machines that would make their day-to-day -day lives even easier. One such creation was the Circus Tower, known by its more common name, the Crystal Tower. This gigantic magical battery stood as a testament to what mortal men are truly capable of when given the chance, and the clean energy this tower provided the Empire would benefit the lives of countless people. However, the Alagan Empire would soon realize that paradise isn't truly everything you'd hope it is. After many generations, the Alagan people no longer knew the true meaning of things like pain, suffering and trauma. They could have almost anything they wanted and live long, carefree lives thanks to their medicine and technology. But without any threats to overcome or strife to measure against their joy, their happiness steadily became hollow. People became lazier and content to indulge in selfish pleasures whilst their machines did most of the day-to-day -day work for them. The Alagans quite literally became bored with life. As such, their society began to spoil and fester like an infection. Things like reason, empathy and even love started to disappear as the Alagan people became numb to their own existence. But the worst part arose when inflicting horrors upon their fellow man became a source of entertainment. The Alagan Empire was now fully corrupt, spoiled by its own glory. Only a handful of intellectual groups remained. They could still think rationally about the future of their country, and what they saw on the horizon was a complete societal collapse. As they debated on how to correct the direction of their failing empire, one man would take it upon himself to do just that and more, the scientist Amon. He had observed the empire's fall from grace with disgust, and he saw the selfish whims of its people as ugly blemishes in need of fixing. He came to the realization that what the empire needed wasn't a new invention, but a strong leader. Though instead of waiting for one such person to arise, Amon would create one. In fact, he would recreate the greatest leader in Alagan history. He would bring back Emperor Zande. After unethical experiments that resulted in the altered minds and bodies of his colleagues, Amon began the process of cloning Zande. But this time he wouldn't live a mortal life. Amon would give Zande an immortal body so that he might rule for all eternity. Eventually he succeeded, and Emperor Zande walked the earth once more. After a few days of educating Zande on everything that had happened in his absence, the Emperor rolled his eyes in annoyance and decided to get to work immediately. He began by assassinating the current Alagan Emperor, as well as executing anyone that dared to stand in his way. Most Alagan people had become so powerless that none could stand up to his might. After seizing power, Zande declared the three great continents was not enough for his empire so they were going to liberate a massive continent to the south, they were going to invade Mericidia. As Amon predicted, the fear of Zande's wrath had injected pain back into the hearts of the Alagan people, and their empire began to mobilize just like it had in ages past. With pride, Amon stood by Zande's side as the empire began moving their military might towards the shores of Mericidia. Societies that lived alongside dragons had long since endured here, and the dragon's leader, Dawnworm Bahamut, would meet the Empire on the fields of battle. His might held them back for the longest time, but after creating fiendish chimeras to outnumber and overpower him, Bahamut would die and leave Mericidia defenseless. However, the people would not take this lying down, and summoned godlike entities called primals to push back the Empire's forces. As living things born from raw aether and the unflinching faith of those that summoned them, the primals were a force that the Empire had trouble overcoming. But this made Zande's blood race with excitement, as his military would devise creative ways to outmaneuver and subdue these would-be gods. The primals would fall and be captured by the Empire, preventing more summoning. Yet the climax of this war would only happen when an image of Dawnworm Bahamut would be summoned into the form of a primal. 
this new primal Bahamut would become the greatest threat to the Empire's crusade. But instead of worrying about casualties, Zande's madness began to show as he enjoyed the back and forth this war had created. Like a massive game of chess with people's lives on the board, he kept playing. But even this new form of Bahamut couldn't stand up to the darkness that Zande was about to unleash. Emperor Zande had made a pact with the Cloud of Darkness, a demonic entity from a hellish realm called the Void, and with her power, he unleashed legions of Void Scent upon Bahamut and Merisidia both. This was the final play, as the combined power of the Void and a new weapon called Omega defeated and captured Bahamut. They sealed the dragon away in a red sphere called Delamut, which was made to orbit the world as a second moon. While the Empire's campaign against Merisidia was a success, many Alagans saw only cruelty and insanity on full display. They knew that once the war was over, a new reign of terror was bound to begin, and that the Alagan people, while foolish, would be made to suffer. Many groups would put plans into place to safeguard the Empire's best interest should the worst come to pass, but eventually a massive revolution to dethrone the Mad Emperor would occur. Zande would retreat to the Crystal Tower and attempt to use it to open a massive gate to the Void and allow the Cloud of Darkness itself to overrun the entire world. But Zande made a fatal error. Due to his actions, the world's ether was unstable and his attempt to use the tower to such an end was the last straw. The very earth beneath the Crystal Tower shattered and the monument sank beneath the ground as earthquakes began to ravage everything the Empire had worked to build. These tremors spread across the world, and so began the fourth umbral calamity, the Calamity of Earth, beginning a tragic end to the prosperous Alagan Empire. The only places spared this global destruction were flying structures like that of Azizla. But even so, their ruin was only delayed as all the supplies, energy and reinforcements they once received from the land were now completely gone. Most people on these floating structures steadily began to die of starvation as they became trapped and isolated, or were eventually killed by their own monstrous creations as they no longer had the means of keeping them contained indefinitely. But all was not lost. As stated previously, there were indeed groups that had gone out of their way to try and protect the people from the cruelty of Alag's first and last emperor, Zande. Princess Selina, one of the descendants of the original Zande, had survived the quakes with a small group of people at her side. She wept at the countless lives that were lost to the calamity, but upon realizing what had happened to the crystal tower, she knew that Zande and Amon were likely still alive and their madness wasn't over. Lacking the means to destroy the tower, she knew it was only a matter of time until it would surface again, releasing Zande upon an unsuspecting world. In her wisdom, Princess Selina knew that the Emperor's deal with the Cloud of Darkness was one of blood, so as long as someone with her heritage survived into the future, there would always be someone capable of commanding the Crystal Tower and banishing the malicious Void Scent that would devour the world. As such, she used what little Alagan technology had survived the quakes to her advantage, passing on the blessings and burdens of the Alagan royal bloodline to one of her dearest friends. A commoner in whom this power would be passed down from generation to generation without notice until the day it was needed to counter the newly emerged Crystal Tower. Eventually this royal blood did survive into the modern age becoming the responsibility of the Makote belonging to the Ji tribe. Any Makote in this tribe born with red eyes were marked as the ones who had inherited Princess Selina's legacy. But for all the preparations made, there was no going back. The earthquakes had claimed untold lives, and those that survived had next to nothing. The grief caused by such a tragedy eventually created hysteria as the victims hopelessly looked for someone or something to blame for all of this destruction. Eventually, the blame was laid at the feet of their technology, progress, and even education itself. Many survivors regressed into an exceedingly primitive mindset, seeing any kind of technological development or higher learning as sinful and ruinous. 
This caused them to burn books, destroy what little Alagan technology survived the quakes, and willfully demolish buildings. This marked the beginning of the Fourth Astral Era, otherwise known as the Forgotten Age. The Fourth Astral Era created no end of crazed individuals and religious zealots who did everything in their power to crush higher learning. Even philosophers and scientists would be killed simply for knowing more than others. This war against knowledge would persist for an unknown amount of time, as no records detailing the Fourth Astral Era were ever created. In fact, this age, and those people living within it, are the sole reason almost all knowledge about the first, second, and third eras have vanished from history. We don't know what groups may or may not have existed during this time. The only thing we know for certain is that their hatred for reason and learning wouldn't save them from the elemental tragedy that was about to befall them. For about 1500 years, the fourth astral era would persist, but at the end of that time, Another calamity would visit the ignorant masses of the world. No one knows how, when, or why this calamity began, only that it spelled doom for many more peoples and cultures. The fifth umbral calamity, the Calamity of Ice, had begun to freeze the entire world. The only reason we know that it was indeed a calamity that had frozen the entire planet is because all tribes and cultures in the world began creating folk tales of endless blizzards and frozen rivers all at the same time. This calamity saw most crops fail, as they couldn't survive the harsh cold, leaving many to die of starvation if the freezing winds didn't claim their lives first. No amount of book burning or divine worship could save them, as this calamity had claimed just as many innocent people as the ones preceding it. Some tribes took advantage of the ice, migrating over places where even the ocean had frozen over, attempting to find a location where they could thrive despite the constant cold. These individuals would have seen massive mountains made entirely of ice floating across the ocean's surface as they travelled, with some of those gigantic glaciers even existing to this very day. Meanwhile, within Eorzea, it was around this time that a resplendent cathedral was built, the location of which would eventually become a massive forest that is now known as the Black Shroud. This church was built as a refuge, a place where people might gather to escape the harsh cold of the world and pray to deities known as the Twelve Gods for protection. It was in this church that magical spells and rituals would be created in an attempt to please the gods and beg for their aid. But eventually, whether by divine intervention or natural causes, the snow and the cold did relent, allowing the warmer locales of temperate and tropical regions to steadily return to normal over time. This breath of heat and relief would mark the beginning of the fifth astral era, which would later be known as the Age of Enlightenment. As the entire world once again became warmer and more vibrant, the people would become more eager to leave whatever locations they had used to hide from the cold. The people that hid themselves in or around the cathedral in Eorzea began to spread out across the continent of Aldenard once more, taking with them the teachings of their favoured god, as well as the spells and rituals used to appease them. As they spread, these small groups of people would grow into various settlements, towns and then cities as their cultures became more diverse. There would eventually be 12 city-states in total across Eorzea, each devoted to a different god of the Twelve's pantheon. However, as these city-states grew in size and strength, the differences with their neighbours became more apparent. This would create friction between the various countries, as things like territorial disputes became all too common. Small skirmishes would become localised wars, as they began to fight for their gods and their claim to the land. Though as time progressed, these wars would die out and peace would finally reign over Eorzea. After the dust settled, there stood twelve proud nations, each with their own patron god. But among these twelve, only three would rise to prominence. These were Amdipur, located near central Aldenard, Nim, which occupied the entire island of Vilbrand, as well as most of Eorzea's western coast, and finally Mach, which found itself in the western basin of Yafim. With the borders of these countries now well defined, each city-state began to prosper in their own way, 
with many of them creating and developing their own forms of magic, thanks to the rituals they inherited from the worship of each of their twelve gods. The country considered to be the greatest of all city-states during this era was that of Amdipur. The leaders of this country were considered as generous and understanding as an older sibling, since Amdipur repeatedly did everything in its power to keep the peace and encourage the development of the smaller city-states surrounding it. Eventually, this civilization would become known as Ancient Amdipur, and it was believed that this country acted with wisdom and maturity well beyond its years. This focus on inward improvement made the Amdipuri excel at spellcraft, developing many magical means to not only improve their lives, but defend themselves as well. Instead of magical development, the country of Nim became more well known for its navy and commerce, as they became a center of trade within Eorzea. This earned it a good deal of geopolitical security, for to harm Nim would be to disturb supply chains that everyone benefited from. Moreover, Nim would eventually create the finest marines within Eorzea, making engaging them in naval warfare a death sentence. Between their command of the ocean and eagerness for trade, Nim more than earned its place as one of Aldenard's three superpowers during the Fifth Astral Era. However, in the northwestern reaches of Eorzea, the smaller city-state of Match would eventually develop something that fundamentally shifted the balance of power within the continent. Halfway through the Fifth Astral Era, a powerful mage would be born and raised in the country of Match. Her name was Shetoto, a Lalafelin woman of great renown and prestige, who only ever had one goal in life – to test the boundaries of magic itself. To that end, she would inevitably weave the first ever incantations of a ruinous magic school. Shetoto had created Black Magic. The people of Match immediately saw Black Magic for what it truly was – the most powerful school of magic ever developed in terms of raw destructive potential. It was so strong that almost no barrier could defend against it, and almost no healing spell could fully mend what damage was done. Shetoto had not a care in the world for what her country did with the spell school she crafted, as she was already researching new forms of magic. But the leadership of Match took her research to heart, and through the teachings of Black Magic, the city-state of Match had gained the most powerful standing military in all of Eorzea. However, as the old saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely and the leadership of Match steadily became all too eager to test their strength against their neighbours. With these new black mages at their disposal, the city-state of Match began to launch campaigns against their neighbouring countries, and such overwhelming force was there for all to witness. Many smaller civilizations had no means of countering these new potent forms of offensive spells, and became deeply fearful of being conquered. These aggressive actions did not go unnoticed by the people of Amdipur, who immediately knew that Match and its black mages must be made to yield. The many years that Amdipur spent weaving spells for the betterment of all were not in vain, as the greatest mages among them would create the antithesis of black magic. Where the people of Match would destroy, corrupt and reduce, this new spell school would protect, purify and mend. With great success, the Archmages of Amdipur became the first ever White Mages, and with this new spell school, they had the strength to stop the relentless assault of the Black Mages. This became the first magical war between these two countries within the First Astral Era. Match was shocked to see that the White Mages of Amdipur had become their perfect counter, stopping their country's expansion in its tracks. Match's leadership hesitated ending their campaign against Eorzea. However, the end of this war had shifted the power on the continent. Where once there were twelve proud countries, only six remained, having either been conquered by Match or joined other city-states out of fear. But this fragile peace would only last a handful of centuries. The mages of Match had found and created another spell school, in the form of Void Magic allowing them to channel the corrupting powers of the Void, and command legions of Void Scent, much like the Alagan Empire did before them. Meanwhile, the country of Nim, in its desperate attempts to avoid conquest, created the magic school used by scholars in order to shield themselves from black magic. 
Amdapur, on the other hand, attempted to counter the use of Void Scent by weaving their white magic into creating armies of living stone in the form of golems that would do their bidding. Tension was now at an all-time high. As such, no one knows what the actual catalyst for the coming conflict was, only that it sparked what would forever be known as the War of the Magi. This war lasted for many years across multiple generations, and during this time, magic was at its peak. Many sorcerers and witches would engage in the greatest arcane duels in Hydaelyn's history, as demons from the void would collide with animated golems mid-air. Match and Amdapur both would gain and lose ground for decades, with the people of Nim being forced to abandon their country due to a plague placed upon them by the void scent of Match. However, over the course of the war, the near constant use of magic by many thousands of mages had drained the ambient aether of Eorzea. Much like the excessive violence of Zande before them, the War of the Magi had caused the world to be thrown off balance, and as such, another calamity was soon to come. The conflict between the countries of Mark and Amdapur had lasted for generations, and with thousands of black and white mages abusing their power over hundreds of years, it was only a matter of time until the world itself could no longer keep up with their spells. Aether, the source of power for all magic, was steadily being drained from Eorzea, and eventually the tipping point was reached. The War of the Magi ended with no true victor, only a world gone mad as billowing rain clouds formed overhead and the seas began to rise. The ceaseless conquest of the Maki had welcomed the sixth umbral calamity. But unlike the catastrophes that came before it, there were people who had been prepared for the coming ruin. While the fifth astral era was most well known for creating black and white magic, many other arcane disciplines had also been developed in that time, including spells belonging to the school of divination, which had warned many powerful mages of the coming calamity. The rituals revealed that the mild rain would eventually evolve into a torrential downpour that would swallow most of the world. As such, many individuals set plans into motion to save not only themselves, but as many people as they could. Most civilizations simply told their people they needed to get to higher ground, and by climbing up the sides of mountains, they would avoid the coming floods. Many mages from Mac and Amdapur began to shepherd their people into Eorzea's northern mountains. Known today as Abalathia's Spine, this massive mountain range saved countless lives as the calamity of water steadily became a force of nature. But Eorzea's mountains weren't the only refuge people sought from the deluge. The Void Mages of Mark built a vessel they called the Void Ark, which would carry many people into the sky and away from the waves. Even though this ark succeeded in carrying its passengers into the sky, it eventually became their tomb as the many void scent that were powering the vessel broke free from their prisons and began slaughtering their masters. While the Void Ark was a disaster, there was another vessel that not only served its purpose, but became the foundation of an entire country. This ship was called Nuncrep's Hope. This vessel was captained by a powerful Rogadin mage, after whom the ship was named. He was one of the Twelve Archons, a group of powerful men and women who spread out across the world to try and save as many people from the Calamity as possible. Nuncrep succeeded in his purpose, using a powerful spell to save his ship and the people on it from a massive tidal wave. However, the spell also beached his vessel on the cliffs of Girabania, where it has remained to this day. Eventually, the seas that had consumed most of the world and many civilizations began to calm, and the survivors watched as the waters began to recede. This would eventually mark the beginning of the Sixth Astral Era, as the survivors of the Calamity and its floods would watch the continent steadily return to its original state. But this only marks the beginning of a tumultuous time. Those who lived to see tomorrow had already started to blame the abuse of magic for what had happened to the world. Libraries of ancient arcane arts that had survived the floods were torched as many mages were persecuted and attacked. However, many of these mages still possessed tremendous power and could protect themselves. Labeled as witches and vile wizards, 
Many spellcasters eventually left society on their own terms and lived out the rest of their lives in exile, but not all of them. As the survivors of the Calamity began spreading out across Eorzea and regressing into primitive tribalistic factions, others chose different paths. The major events of this era began with the Rogadin Nuncrep leading the survivors of his people down the cliffs of Girabania and towards Eorzea's western coast. He guided his people across the sea and toward an archipelago northwest of Eorzea, which they turned into their new home. Because Nuncrep was a respected archmage, the people revered him for saving them. He and the survivors didn't shun magic like most of Eorzea. Fueled by the wonders of the arcane, their small village would grow into the prosperous, enlightened country of Old Shalian over the following centuries. While some countries around the world did survive the Calamity, Old Shalian was the first major civilization to arise from Eorzea's ruin. Around the 3rd century, groups of Elizin that had settled near the center of Eorzea were slowly being displaced by large groups of Hyur that were steadily migrating throughout the continent and taking up more land. Many of these Elizin began to move north, into the region known as Kurthas. Here they established a village that would eventually grow into the country of Ishgard. A couple of decades after the Elizin had settled these lands, the great dragon Hrisvelga fell in love with an Elizin woman known as Saint Shiva. Their eventual union began an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity between mortals and dragons, as Ishgard thrived alongside their Dravanian allies. But this peace would only last a couple of hundred years, as the eventual ruler of Ishgard, King Thordan, grew fearful and envious of the dragon's power. In his madness, Thordan and his most trusted knights betrayed the great dragon Ratatoska, stole their power, and lied to the Ishgardian people, claiming the dragons attacked first. This marked the beginning of the Dragon Song War, a conflict that would see Ishgardians and dragons do battle for a thousand years. At the turn of the 7th century, the Lalafell descended from the mages of Mark began to gather in Eorzea's southern Thanalan region. Here the Lalafellian clans would set aside their differences and become a single people once more, creating the country of Belladea. At the same time, Eorzea's largest forest, the Black Shroud, had become the site of many disputes as the Elisen were trying to keep the ever-expanding Hyr off what little territory they still had but the elemental spirits of the Black Shroud were not kind to either the Elizin or the Hyur, leading to both races eventually reconciling their differences and creating the massive underground city known as Gilmora together, where they could shelter from the wrath of the enchanted forest, which could destroy them both if it so desired. In the late 800s, a large group of Rogadin began sailing south from the seas north of Eorzea. They were fleeing the tyranny of their country after a failed coup d'etat in their ancestral homeland of Ursland. In a large ship named the Galadian, they eventually made landfall on the island of Vilbrand. These displaced souls eventually founded a village that would steadily grow into the maritime city of Limsa Laminsa. These early settlers were offered help by the people of Old Shalian, which they promptly refused. The people of Baladia, however, were not so quick to spurn Shalian's aid. Since they shared an interest in magic, both countries agreed to an experiment that the Shalians proposed. This test resulted in the creation of etherite crystals that linked Baladia and Old Shalian, creating the first cross-continental teleportation system in this era. This was a resounding success and would eventually pave the way for etherite crystals to be spread not only across Eorzea but all three great continents, linking multiple countries through teleportation magic. This era of success and mutual cooperation ended when Baladia entered a brutal succession war in the late 900s. After the Sultan of Baladia had passed away, both of his sons fought with each other for the throne. They eventually created their own countries. One was called Sildi and the other Uldar. These city-states continued to war with each other for generations, and old Shalian wanted nothing to do with this war, choosing to disconnect the etherite they bestowed to Belladea until the fighting was over. By this time, Limsa Laminsa had devolved into a pirate den with no true law and order. But all this changed when a new sheriff came to town, named Admiral Agatsar. 
Agatsar forced all the greatest pirate crews to come together and reach an agreement that would serve as the foundation of their country's government. Because of Admiral Agatsar, Limsa Liminsa had the chance to become the respectable city-state it is seen as today. As time passed into the first century of the Sixth Astral Era, things began to rapidly change for the Gilmorans living within their stone city beneath the Black Shroud. A talented human mage named Jorin Lightheart used his spells to start a conversation with the elemental spirits of the forest. This failed at first, but eventually the elementals began to listen to him. Thanks to Jorin's integrity, the elementals agreed to let the Gelmorans live within the forest instead of under it. While most Gelmorans were thrilled at the idea of living above the earth, some saw this as a betrayal of their new culture. Not all Gelmorans left their subterranean city, but the ones that did began to live alongside the elementals of the forest, allowing the city-state of Gridania to take its first breath. Jorin Lightheart eventually had a son, a boy born with special horns that indicated he was blessed by the elementals. Children blessed with these horns soon became the symbol of his station, and Jorin's son would become the first Padjal, a leader for Gradania and its people who bridged the connection between mortals and elementals. The following century was a time of great advancement for most cultures within Eorzea. In fact, it was in the mid-1100s that the continent's final country would emerge in Eorzea's northeast. Many clans of Hyur had lived within the mountains of Girabania since the end of the Sixth Umbral Calamity. But they were never unified until a warlord named Anshelm Kotter forced all clans to submit to his rule. After his conquest, he had a citadel built next to a massive lake, which would become the capital city of a new city-state, Alamigo. From here, history starts to approach the modern age rapidly. Uldar eventually defeated Sildi, becoming the dominant power over Thanalan. Limsa Laminsa entered its golden age of piracy, but later became a hub for most of Eorzea's sea trade. Ishgard continued its war against the dragons, Gridania became a self-sufficient society, and Old Shalian reconnected with its neighbours, building a colony on Eorzea's western coast. Eorzea had entered into its time of relative peace, cooperation and advancement. But as we approach the 1500s of the Sixth Astral Era, we begin to see the end of this productive age. In the latter half of the 1400s, Alamigo's economy began to fail due to the rising success of sea trade created by Uldar and Limsa Liminsa. In an attempt to fix this, Alamigo began an unprovoked war with Gridania, which would become known as the Autumn War. However, because of Gridania's strong alliance with Ishgard, Limsa Liminsa and Uldar, a united Eorzea soundly defeated Alamigo and their economy collapsed. This was only the beginning of Eorzea's new age of troubles. Not even a century later, the Empire of Garlemald had begun its conquest of the three great continents. Like the Black Mages of Mark in the Fifth Era and the Alagan Empire of the Third Era, the Garlians now had their sights on ruling the world. Their conquest began with the continent of Ilsabad, and with the advent of Magitek war machines, they could defeat almost every opponent they came across soundly. In only a handful of decades, the Galian Empire successfully conquered not only the whole of Ilsabad, but also the entire continent of Othard. This left only the continent of Aldenard, and by extension the lands of Eorzea. The Galian Empire began its campaign against Alamigo first, which was still recovering from its economic collapse and a rebellion against its incredibly unpopular mad monarch, King Theodoric. Because of Alamigo's sudden and barbaric attack during the Autumn War, not a single city-state within Eorzea helped them fight Garlemald. Alamigo swiftly fell, leaving Gridania, Uldar, Ishgard and Limsa Liminsa to fight this new threat alone. Not even the Shalians in their western colony would help, with most of them fleeing back to their homeland. Some Shalians saw the immediate withdrawal from Eorzea as cowardice, so instead of abandoning their neighbours to the Galian invasion, these scholars rallied behind a wise and powerful archon named Louisois Le Veilleur. Louisois and other Shalians assisted in helping the city-states of Eorzea push back the Galian Empire. But regardless of their efforts, the second half of the 1500s marked the end of the Sixth Astral Era. 
dubbed Project Meteor. A leader of the invasion, known as the White Raven, used ancient technology to call down Delamud, the artificial moon the ancient Allegans used to contain the elder primal Bahamut. Most Gallians had no idea they were releasing an old evil upon the world. As Bahamut was broken free of his prison, his rampage threatened to destroy everything, resulting in the beginning of the seventh umbral calamity. But this time something was different. Louis Le Veilleur had made many preparations to deal with Bahamut, and used powerful magics to try and seal the primal away once more. Unfortunately, the dragon had become too powerful, and was prepared to unleash an attack that would glass the entirety of Eorzea. Archon Louisois' ritual had failed, but the power to cast his spell remained. Louisois made a sacrifice, taking all that magic into himself alongside Eorzea's prayers to rise from Bahamut's ruin. In doing so, he became the primal known as Phoenix, slaying Bahamut in a single strike, and ending the seventh umbral calamity before it could devastate the world. The Seventh Umbral Calamity was the shortest era in Eorzea's history, and it was all thanks to Louisois and the help of his many allies. If Bahamut hadn't been slain, his rage would have been felt across the entire world. But with one age's end, another has the chance to begin. Five years after Bahamut's defeat, a warrior of light will rise, and a new story will be told. This marks the end of our video covering the Astral and Umbral eras up until the modern day of Final Fantasy XIV's campaign. We hope you enjoyed this series and that it helps you in your journey across the world of Hydaelyn. We plan to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video, and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.